Hello, good morning, mummies. So nice to have you here for another Coffee Morning on Bumpwise. And we have a very special guest today, first time on Bumpwise, and we're super happy to have you. Hi, Sarinda. Hi, Johanna. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me to speak here today. I'm very excited for the conversation that lies ahead. Most welcome. So the topic today is dental health, not mental health health I hope you didn't misread that so we're going to talk about oral development what happens to our teeth in pregnancy um are we really responsible for our children's cavities and all of that but I'm going to let Sarinda introduce herself while we get other moms to join and yeah obviously those of you are watching on Facebook as well hello and um, put your questions in the in the chat as well okay Awesome, thank you. So, Sorry. everybody, um, some of you may know me, some of you may not. I am a dentist in Singapore, based in Singapore from the UK, and I take a whole person or holistic approach to oral health. So, um, I currently work at Wheelock Place on Orchard Road, and I see a big range of different wonderful people uh, from little tiny tots right up to adults. And I've got a few bits to share with you today. Uh, keep your questions coming in and then we'll address some of those at the end as I'm sure there will be uh, some questions coming over. So I've got a few slides to share first, just as a little bit of an overview about oral health. And then we'll dive in some, into some aspects, maybe of growth and development, um, as Johanna mentioned, uh, pregnancy and postpartum and those kind of aspects. Okay, so I'm just sharing my screen now. Amazing. Wonderful. Great. So why is oral health so important? Um, a lot of people don't realize, but as we know, the mouth is totally connected to the rest of the body. When you think about it, even dentistry as a subject is separate, uh, particularly like in places like the UK, it's a separate course to medicine. So it's like this kind of separation between dental health and overall health but there's definitely a mouth body connection. There are diseases in the body that can present in the mouth, such as diabetes, um, heart issues, and vice versa. And there are a lot of these, it's not just those two. It's also interesting to note that the mouth absorbs absolutely everything. So if you think about what you're putting into your mouth, it goes straight into the system and that includes our toothpaste. So what's in our toothpaste, whatever that combination is and whatever you're choosing for yourself and your household is going to be absorbed into the system every day, twice a day. And there's a lot of aspects about preventing disease and pain inside the mouth. If you've got toothache, it hurts. I have some of my patients, some of my mommies coming into me saying, I would rather give birth <laughs> than come and see you at the dentist. Um, no. yeah, right? It's um, appreciating. It's, yeah, yeah, and it's, it's, it's a very common thing, uh, dental procedures, and often it relates to some kind of trauma in childhood trauma, uh, which has been experienced previously, uh, which is why mommies are sometimes like, I prefer to give birth. Um, I'm a mother of two, so I, I can really appreciate that this is something that's quite a big deal. There are also social factors associated with oral health. So we live in a planet where, on the planet, and when we look around, we do, um, and we are exposed to advertising and what a smell should look like. So what's given to us is this, nice white bright smile um no kind of different colors no brown staining none of this the teeth are perfectly straight and there is something with this particularly the straight broad smiles because intuitively know that this is healthy when we're looking at crooked teeth we intuitively know actually it's not meant to look like that and we actually do understand as individuals that when the teeth are crooked there's probably not optimum health in the body. Mm -hmm. We're not breathing properly. There are other aspects that we actually primitively understand and know about. So these are adult teeth. And I'm just showing you these images because I tend to get better photos of adult teeth than children's teeth. And yes. for those of you who have children, pretty much all of you or you're expecting when you have children, mm -hmm. um, these are taken in different locations in Singapore. There are two of my patients uh, that I saw many years ago. And I'd just like to orientate you as to what healthy looks like. Mm -hmm. So 
you these are people from different backgrounds so we do also need to understand that the the color of the gum might be slightly different in different people from different backgrounds what? we want to see pink gum we mm. want to see pink gum bleeding or red gum something like this um swollen gums are not healthy that is indicating we are not healthy these teeth are very white at the top we need to appreciate and we can appreciate that teeth come in all different colors when we're younger the teeth tend to be a whiter shade as we do get older our teeth do change in shade mm -hmm. um so these kind of teeth are looking healthy straighter teeth naturally straighter teeth that's a good sign of health and when we're looking at the bottom here you can see this is plaque and calculus yeah plaque which is sugars uh combining with bacteria inside the mouth they sit around it sits around the gum edge it can sit on top of the teeth as well it creates an acid so it can create either dental cavities or it can start to push the gum back and irritate the gum. Then you get bleeding gums, which we'll talk more about later on. Obviously, this is not so healthy here at the front. This is a tooth that's been affected by gum issues and it's starting to fall out. So this is something that's not looking so healthy. Mm -hmm. You can also see here in this picture, you can't see here the tongue position, which we'll talk about a little bit more later on. So when people come in, they come in in pain, they come in for various reasons. Two of the big things that I see in adults and children, dental decay. So this could be known as dental caries. Your dentist might call it dental caries, cavities, holes, mm -hmm. bleeding gums. Um, and the, the clinical terminology for this is gingivitis. That is when the gums are bleeding or periodontal disease. So these, this affects the tissues around the teeth, which we'll dive more into shortly. So a cavity might present in this way. It might be that you don't see it on the top surface. It might just be on the the, end, the below surface, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment. And that's an example of some gum issues that are quite severe. It doesn't always present in this way. Mm -hmm. okay. This is the process of how a cavity develops. And I do feel as parents, it's, it's always handy to understand why and how these things are happening. So if you look at this image here, this is the nerve in the middle of the mouth. This is the blood supply and the nerve supply. Around that, you've got something called dentine. This is a softer layer of the tooth. And then you've got the outer enamel. This is the bit of the tooth that you see inside the mouth. So looking from this aspect, when you look in your child's mouth, that's what you're going to see, okay. this aspect of the tooth. Now you've got the gum and you've got the bone supporting the gum underneath. And then you've got the roots of the teeth underneath. So that's the anatomy, the basic anatomy of the tooth. And what can happen if the teeth are exposed to an acid on a regular basis, um, the sugar and bacteria create an acid, um, acidic foods, dry mouth, so the saliva's not washing um, foods and acids away. The, pH, the pH of the mouth is also very important. Again, the acid you tend to get something developing called a white spot. So if your dentist says, oh, your child's got a white spot on the tooth, it's an early cavity developing, very, oh. very early. It's in enamel. At this point, it's reversible. At this mm -hmm. point, it's reversible. Okay. Now, if it develops, you're going to start seeing enamel decay. So you might it might turn into a brown spot later on. Once it is into the dentine and you've got this going on, this is a point where we need to seriously be thinking, do we need to intervene? Do we need to do something with this? Because the dentine is a lot softer than enamel. Enamel is the hardest substance in the body. It's harder than bone. So when you've got this going on, we're thinking how quickly is this decay going to go into the nerve? Because once it's into the nerve, we're going to be in a bit of a sticky situation of what we do with the tooth. Your okay. child might be saying at this point, I've got toothache, it's hurting a little bit, it's sensitive. They might be complaining of sensitivity. If it is left, um, then it can go into the nerve. If the decay is extending into the nerve, at this point, there's not a lot we can do really to save the tooth. 
your child might be complaining if it's gone into the nerve and they're developing a little infection underneath here mm -hmm. um you might see a swelling a lot of pain mommy i've got pain at night can't sleep uh rolling around pointing in the mouth um in baby teeth there are a lot of problems uh that can arise from this and some of the issues are if you have an infection obviously it's managing your child firstly managing the pain and the these um, aspects and then the adult teeth will be growing underneath in this area here mm -hmm. you can imagine that adult tooth is here it might not be fully developed if your child is very young this infection can start to affect the development of that adult tooth. Oh, okay. So this is why it's when when it's like this, it's like, okay, we need to have a conversation about what the options are here. The adult tooth can uh, be delayed when it comes through because of the infection. Mm -hmm. it come through a different shape, so it can affect the shape uh, and it can affect the color as well. So you can get like brown spots on there, white spots on there. Um, there are other reasons for brown spots and white spots, which I won't dive into right now. But um, with this, picture we are talking about okay do we think it's going to affect the adult tooth how severe is it is your child in pain and and what some of the options are so that's really interesting to know because i think a lot of people don't take their milk teeth seriously because you know they're going to fall out anyway so yeah. why bother yeah, yeah. okay yeah. and i do have moms that come in and they say oh well they're going to get new teeth anyway mm -hmm. they absolutely are so but it's like okay when if they've got decay when they're four and the tooth is going to come out when they're 10 like yeah. what what is that for? that's a long time it's a I mean, long time yeah, to have that decay in the mouth and the development of the adult tooth as well so it is always worth noting that these baby teeth can affect the adult teeth now, some of the causes, so I have moms coming in, and Johanna and I were talking about this just before we went live. When I have moms coming in, there's a big range um, between how health conscious and how how much um, we're aware of what's going on inside the mouth. Some of my um, families who do eat sugar, sometimes I see zero decay, even mm -hmm. though they, they are eating sugar. Um, and some of my families that are very, very health conscious, sometimes see two three cavities and mom and dad come in and like why is this happening yeah. I've breastfed for four years um you know like we eat really healthily they take a vitamin d supplement and they're really really aware and i i understand that is so frustrating i really really do um as i said i have two young children and if you're putting in all this effort and then all of a sudden you're seeing cavities what's going on so the first thing is nutrition, fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K2. We'll talk more about this in a moment. Acids in the mouth. So this includes fruit. So fruit, um, I often see in snack boxes and fruit is, it, it definitely has its place, but there are two things. There's sugar in fruit and acid production. Mm. And when there's a lot of acid going into the mouth, it tips the pH. So the pH is more acidic than alkaline. It's in an acidic environment that we get disease and this imbalance inside. So when we're eating fruit and we're not drinking water after or we're not eating something um, and from a dietary perspective, like something like protein or fatty with it, we don't get the opportunity to neutralize the acid inside the mouth, mm -hmm. especially fruit for breakfast. When we have breakfast or I mean, some people have lemon water, which is wonderful cleansing for the system. And then we pick up the toothbrush 10 minutes right. later, immediately. Yeah. 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 So what's just happened there? The, the acid has made the teeth really soft. And then because the teeth are really soft, they're more susceptible to being worn down. And then we get the toothbrush, we brush it, and we we un, unknowingly are starting to wear down the layer of the enamel on the outside. So then we might start to see wear areas on the teeth. Like, why, why is this happening? Why are my child's teeth getting worn down? Yeah. Um, this as well but that is that is one area is the same true for coffee because coffee is also acidic right black um, coffee. yeah so um i guess kids wouldn't be drinking coffee but no no but me i'm talking about me <laughs> yeah, totally no totally um, yeah, so anything anything acidic any food any drink that you have that is acidic will be tipping the ph inside the mouth so, yeah, so people come in and, and, and they do say, oh, I drink a lot of coffee. Um, so coffee staining is one aspect. And then again, we're looking at the pH of the mouth. So yeah. anything that's going to tip into acidic 
is not going to be so supportive unless we get something in to neutralize. Um, mouth breathing. Um, I know this is a very popular topic and I know a lot of you mommies out there will be aware about mouth breathing. Again, we'll talk more about this in a few moments. Um, mouth breathing does lead to dry mouth. There are also medications if your child um, is taking it, are taking any medications for any reason that can dry the mouth out. And then disease in the body. So there are a lot of diseases in the body that can affect the mouth and vice versa. When I look in the mouth, it is a window into your overall health. And I can tell you a lot about what's going on in the in the system. So gum disease, just to make you aware of this, when I'm doing cleaning for a little one, um, I don't check. Usually we don't check on children the gum health. Usually we do it visually because it's very uncomfortable. We get a little probe. And if you've seen a dentist as an adult, they'll get a little, a little probe, a little stick and put it around the gum and sometimes it's uncomfortable. So we don't generally do that for kids, but just to show you that we should only be able to get the stick when we're doing it, the probe, one to two millimeters down the side of the teeth. If we can get it down further, it's telling us that the gum is unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Why is this important? Because the gum and the bone hold the teeth inside the mouth. If I'm getting the probe in here, this is, absolutely not healthy. If we were to take a dental x-ray, which is something we can actually talk about shortly, um, we would probably see that you've lost bone around here. Wow. You will never get the gum back or the bone back. We will not be able to grow it back. So once that bone is lost, once that, that's gone, it's gone. So if this has dropped back to here, there mm -hmm. is no way we can grow it back. We can do things like grafting. There are surgical procedures that we can do to lift the gum up but it will never naturally grow back. So it's lost. So one of the reasons that we really want to be ensuring we don't have this plaque buildup around the tooth edge is to prevent gum disease. Again, there are lots of other factors contributing, but it's to prevent this the, the bone being lost. When the bone is lost, the teeth become shaky. So the teeth become shaky and then you're in a situation like this, you saw this photo earlier on. Um, this is quite advanced, an advanced situation. But if you look at the adjacent teeth, the teeth next door, you can see these early bits of plaque developing here um, and a situation where the gums are starting to bleed. That's gingivitis, that's the first stage. When it gets to this kind of stage, where it's called periodontitis. Uh, periodontitis meaning the tissues around, surrounding the teeth. Are also affected, okay then we're in trouble because the teeth are shaky, they're falling out. Then we're looking at, do we take the teeth out? Do we keep them in? Have you got an infection? Lost teeth, particularly at the front. We like our front yeah. teeth. We like our back teeth as well. But you know, for, for the aesthetic aspect, do you need a replacement? Denture, bridges, implants. Mm -hmm. so mainly in adults. I don't see this so much in children. I You can see it in children, but mainly in adults. So just to show you what dental calculus looks like and fun fact, um, you have salivary glands inside the mouth. The saliva on the bottom of the mouth ejects here under the tongue, okay? The saliva contains calcium. There's calcium in the saliva. The reason a lot of people come in and say, hey, I keep getting barrel up here is because in the saliva there's calcium, it hits the plaque here and it sticks. You will never be able to get that off with your toothbrush, no matter how hard you try, because it's calcified, okay. it's stuck. This is also an indication if you're getting a very rapid buildup of calcium, um, that the calcium in the body is not going to the right places. It shouldn't really be showing up. I do expect a little bit there, but we shouldn't be getting like loads and loads and loads and very, very fast buildup. Um, because the calcium should be going to the bones and the teeth, as opposed to into the saliva and to the soft tissues. So, it can so show could up. there be an issue with supplements at this point? People taking supplements without, I don't know, that they're not in the right composition or taking too much calcium, actually, because a lot of our mummies, especially in pregnancy, are prescribed high doses of calcium that I find a little bit misplaced. Yeah, so it can be, but also it's um, the calcium being directed to the right places. Yeah. So we take calcium, but we also need vitamin D and K2 to help. Yeah um where the calcium is going so when i see this kind of situation i do ask and i ask generally how are your vitamin d levels we can't measure so much k2 um but the k2 is is sending the calcium to the correct places 
um, mm -hmm. various proteins. So it is to look at, and sometimes we do blindly supplement, yes. which I think if you are um, intuitive, to, enough to know what your body needs or you have worked uh, with practitioners in the past and you know what your body needs is wonderful and you're doing your own thing and that's great but sometimes we do need a handhold uh, maybe some blood work done to see exactly what's going on and um, speaking to maybe a functional doctor a naturopath a nutritionist about what actually our body needs at that point in time okay so a, D, there's vitamin E as well, um, fat-soluble vitamin E, calcium, vitamin K2. There are a long list of vitamins and minerals that are really important for oral health. I've just picked out these few because these are, I wouldn't say the more important, but they are kind of the more important ones that people should know about. Mm -hmm. um, so in a nutshell, I try to simplify this as much as possible. Vitamin A supports the bone development and activates the growth with vitamin D. So they work together. So if your vitamin D is low, your vitamin A isn't functioning okay. as well as it should be. Mm -hmm. Vitamin D helps to helps the body to absorb calcium. So when we're seeing that, that build up there, ah, maybe there's a vitamin D deficiency and the calcium isn't going to the right places in the system. So it activates genes influencing cell growth and, and differentiation. Calcium, as we know, is the building block of the skeletal system and is very important as well for teeth. And vitamin K2 supports bone development. So the K2 activates proteins, which are osteocalcium and matrix GLA, to direct calcium to the right places. And in this way, when the K2 is good, we can reverse cavities through the second layer of the tooth called dentine, so it fights bacteria via something called the odontoblasts and it helps to fix holes in teeth. So remineralize the teeth. Mm -hmm. but these are actually very important. Um, and again, I think in children, it is a little bit challenging unless you get blood work done to know what is happening. And again, can we find out how much K2 is in the system? Um, so it's working with a practitioner to help support as best we can. Yeah, uh, there's something you can do as well. Sorry, is this thank something? You. Sorry, is this something you can do as well, or would you send to a nutritionist or dietitian? I would send to a nutritionist or dietitian. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I can discuss and um. Okay. I uh, yeah. I would send. I would send to somebody else to help support you through that, um, that makes sense. journey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Some of you mummies out there might have heard of Weston A. Price. Um, he was a dentist based in Cleveland in the nineteen thirties. He went globe trotting and he had a look around the world at different communities and um, made some really interesting discoveries, particularly around nutrition, but also facial development. So he discovered, you know, the importance of vitamins A, D, E and K2. He's not the only one. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done on this. And he also realized the importance of nutrients in food and our diet and what we're eating and the exposures that we have. So if we look at our world today, there are some interesting aspects to our food system and the foods that we're exposed to, the packeted food, the canned food. And, um, you know, as a mom, I think if you're based in Singapore, we really have the privilege of having help in the house. So this is something that's really beneficial, especially around food. Um, there are a lot of additives and things uh, that go into things on the shelf. Refined sugar, flour, um, processed dairy. These can all impact our children's development quite significantly. The other aspect is that we are um, involved in a diet with soft food. So when we're giving porridge for breakfast, which is totally fine. We have porridge for breakfast. It's soft. We are yeah. not using our muscles. Okay. So we're not chewing. It's literally just like yeah, yeah. minimal work has to be done to get that into our systems. Um, smoothies. So if we're giving smoothies, which are wonderful and you can load up a lot of stuff in there, it's important to balance it out with something like crunchy carrots. Mm -hmm. stick something crunchy um if you if you eat meat uh something chewy inside the mouth to get the workout for the muscles because we know that when our muscles are used and they're used well 
it tells the bone to grow and develop um, and stay strong, which is why as we, as our bodies get older and any age really, you know, do, do that resistance weight training, you know, um, build, building up the bones and the muscles um, have this effect on the face as well. So what do we see in these images? This is a well-developed phase from a native diet. I appreciate accessing a native diet now is, I would say, almost impossible. <laughs> yeah. And the quality of the food when you do get your veggies and your, you know, what you're thinking are like, yeah, but the vitamins and minerals, the quality is just so much less. Yeah. The like the the amount of vitamins and minerals in our food now has diminished a lot. Yeah, because of extensive farming and yeah the soil right like where are, the soil, the, mic the microbes in the soil like all of it gosh this is just like a massive topic in itself so i will keep away from that and then singapore specifically where we have to ship everything from like so much it sits on the container ship for so long and on shelves so long we don't it's not like we're getting it fresh from the field anymore right so Absolutely. that depletes it too Absolutely, like this farm to table you know this tree to table is just yeah heard of I think particularly in places like Singapore when we're when we're like in a city and a lot of our food has traveled more than we have yes <laughs> when we look at what's on our plate where is this coming from it's like yeah. you know. um so development we see in these native diets these beautiful broad facial structures straight teeth naturally straight teeth wide nasal passages uh like a broad neck structure um, these really, really beautiful smiles. So you can see that um, at the top here. And then at the bottom, this is a picture of somebody who has been exposed to refined food. So um, maybe like a train has come in and dropped off a load of canned food and refined sugary food. Maybe he's gone away to study, these kind of situations. And then what are we seeing here? We're seeing a high palate. So it's gone from like being nice and broad like this to something like this, crooked teeth. Um, lips are sealed here, which is good. Longer necks, longer faces. Yeah. We've got these lovely wide broad faces here. And this is basically happened to all of us. There is, I mean, when I, when I look around myself, like I am not this, you know, I am more in, in this kind of way. So what can we do about it? Um, so there are lots of other aspects of this nutrition, um, the social element for health as well, being together, the community, these are all really important factors um, for growth and development um, as we're multidimensional beings. We're bio-individuals and multidimensional. There are so many facets to health. So just going in a little bit to mouth breathing, here are some of the contributing factors. And here are some of the things you might see in your child, um, even as an adult, you might see this as well. So factors, we have a genetic factor, an epigenetic factor. So um, when somebody comes into me and I, I ask this question, how long was your little one breastfed for? And I appreciate the breastfeeding journey is very personal and challenging um, in different ways. Um, you know, sometimes it's like four years. And then when I'm looking at, at the little one there, I'm like, wow, even after four years of breastfeeding, there can still be issues with mouth breathing and development. And then when I look at mom and dad's facial structure, it's like, uh, I can see the link here. I can see that the development is, has followed on from yourself, which is totally fine. This is nobody's fault. This is just way genetics work. But the epigenetics, we can maybe do something about meaning what are our choices in those moments? What are those environmental factors uh, that can help to prevent uh, these little ones ending up like us? I'm also- so Will you talk a little bit more about how breastfeeding affects uh, the orofacial development as opposed to bottles? Yeah, so if you think when um, your baby is latching onto the nipple, um, and it's also important to note latching well. So again, um, this is a journey in itself, getting a good latch. What happens is the tongue presses the nipple to the palate, so it presses it up, and it has to go through a, a process called, it's called suckling, of pressing the nipple to get the milk out. Which mm -hmm. it takes a lot of effort. It takes a yeah. lot of effort to do that. It works all of these areas of the face, all of the muscles. It also encourages the lower, the lower part of the face, the mandible, to come forward. Yeah. Aspect as well. So we're getting good practice 
and and really good growth um, in this area of the face. Mm -hmm. When we're using a bottle, they don't really have to do much for the yeah. maximum power. It is literally, you, if, if you've ever actually drank from a bottle yourself, this also goes for drinking bottles for toddlers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> which I see everywhere, these bottles, mm -hmm. hard, like all of this, it's going to affect the development. Um, they just develop an incorrect swallow and there's not much that needs to be done to get milk out of a bottle. If you put a bottle to a baby, you will see, and I work, I'm, I work, you know, a couple of days a week. So my daughter does use a bottle. Um, in an ideal world, she would not, but she's mainly breastfed. So I'm not saying don't use a bottle, but it's just to understand that it's easy for them. They'll just chug yeah. it it's gone yeah. so they they don't rather than spending you know a good like 15 whatever 20 minutes an hour on the breast practicing mm -hmm. and using these muscles so there's a very big difference so breastfeeding is so important if you can um and you know again the picture looks different for everybody if you can stick with that please do it if you can um not only you know for the facial development the bonding um the nutrients uh the immune support it's doing your child such a wonderful um you know giving them a really helping hand and setting them up for life yeah. Um, so yeah that's really the difference between the bottle and then we really want to encourage our children to have a correct swallow so swallowing like this you know you see this kind of thing we should actually be using these muscles mm -hmm. it should look like so, yeah Really any movement in the face. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Which is very challenging. And even as an adult, I've had to retrain myself to swallow in this way. When uh -huh. you use these muscles, it's very supportive of the airway. We want a nice broad airway. We don't want a like a really thin airway. If we have a really like this kind of thinness in the in the this area, we're not we can't get oxygen and air down as freely as mm -hmm. it's so again, this is to do with the development. So contributing, other contributing factors to mouth breathing, you know, they could be blocked sinus issues, um, allergies. So, you know, there are like dust mites, mold in your space. Um, if you're a mommy hearing this for the first time, particularly in Singapore, we have a big issue with mold and yeah. you sometimes don't even see it. It can be white mold and your child may possibly be having an allergic reaction to it stuff mm -hmm. is all of this um it might be running through the aircon system um so just to be aware that this could be contributing um to your child and then turning them into a mouth breather without you even realizing um enlarged adenoids so this is something anatomical which would need to be addressed by an ear nose and throat specialist um the way they do this is through a scope so they put a little camera inside to see what's going on you uh, people have mixed feelings about this, but just to share that information that there might be enlarged adenoids um, or tonsils, which could be contributing to mouth breathing. The nutrition we've spoke about somewhat um, tongue tie, big topic. Yeah, that's a massive topic. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to go there today with tongue tie. Oh, it's yeah, too much. It can be at the front. It can be at the back. Um, it's basically in summary. If you if your child has got a tongue tie. Uh, they are not going to be able to get the tongue on the top of the palate. If the tongue is not on the top of the palate, you're not going to get that support for the palate to grow well. That's, mm -hmm. that's the crux of it. So if the tongue's on the floor of the mouth, again, we said before that the tongue is a muscle. So the tongue's a muscle. And when a muscle is um, activating the bone, the bone stays strong or it grows and develops. If the tongue is not up there, you're going to have a palate like this as opposed to like this potentially. Um, nasal septums, deviation, nasal polyps, and rarely tumors, rarely, rarely tumors, but just for completion to mention that. So what are you going to see in your child? You're going to see like this little boy here, this little forward head posture, sometimes even more than this. So when our posture is affected, it's not just this area, it's the whole of our back body, our legs going right down to our feet. So our feet can it can be turned in a little bit like this. So you can just have a look at your little one when they're walking, when they're going about their business. What is their posture like? Forward head leaning. Um, so that's going to affect the spine at the back as well. Um, there is the whole, another big topic of sleep apnea. So they could yeah. be snoring at night. Again, another really big topic. Um, you might see the mandible, like in this picture, this is the lower jaw, slightly back. So they mm -hmm. might be like this. Um, and then they might, you know, like have these 
these kind of circles around the eyes. You might see these dark sunken eyes, a longer face. And then you've got things like difficulty concentrating, things like, oh, I think my child's got ADHD or something like this. Yeah. Um, if they're in school, oh, they're not doing so well at school. So this can actually be linked because when you're mouth breathing, you're not getting oxygen. So the the oxygen doesn't mix with nitrous oxide. When we breathe through our nose, it mixes with nitrous oxide and it gets sent to the right places in the body. When mm -hmm. we breathe, the mouth gets dry, all of this, but we don't have that. So it's not filtered, it's not humidified, none of this, that's all done through the nose. And then when it does go in through the mouth, you get actually 20% less oxygen going into and around the lungs. So wow. This is a big, this is really big. Um, there's a great book, which I still haven't read, but I need to, called Breath by yeah. James Nestor. Um, Breath by James Nestor. I work with a couple of the appliances in that book. Um, and it's on my reading list. And it tells what? you everything you need to know about breathing. And this is- okay. Aspects. this is one of the aspects um so yeah bed wetting asthma there are actually a lot of um issues that we might see with our kids that could be linked to mouth breathing and i'm not saying it's all of these at all yeah. you might experience one of these all of these it, it could be the range but it's just when you're looking actually the most obvious thing is this yeah okay just looking in this area of the face if you're wondering is my child a mouth breather just look in this area and then you might start piecing together oh yeah they're snoring at night or yeah okay so I think I've got a couple more slides but I'll maybe leave it there for now if anyone's got any questions about anything we've discussed so far I would love to hear from you yeah mums you can put them in the chat or you can also just unmute yourself I have also been noting down some questions that I have for you but let's wait for the mummies I really want you to speak to Sarinda directly and and um tell us all your questions and concerns if there are any otherwise let's do let's continue with ah, there we go yes my daughter has crowded teeth what do you suggest she's three years old okay so at three years old she's likely to have all of her baby teeth through um everything i say now is subject to having a look at your little one um so i need to have a good look at her and see what's going on before i make kind of any diagnosis or medical advice yeah. so this is just like just general very general um so is she a mouth breather it's going to be all of these i'd, I'd ask you all of these questions um mm. what's your breast for um I'm just seeing another question come in there. Uh, what is her diet like? What is her vitamin D like? Is her tongue on the palate? Um, does she have allergies? So addressing all of these things at the moment. For a three-year-old, um, I have a three-year-old son. Um, there's not a lot that we do at this, this stage. One thing you can share with her is some exercises for the mouth. And the easiest one to share, from my experience, is tongue clicks. So a tongue click is like this. So there are two kinds. Okay, and then there's another one where you bring the whole tongue to the top of the mouth like this. I don't know if you can see this. Yeah. Teach her that, teach her that. So that is basically trying to get the tongue on the top of the palate to practice getting it up there because ultimately that's where the tongue wants to be. I'd also be asking you questions about the latch. Is there a tongue tie? Has she been assessed for a tongue tie? Um, how crowded are the teeth? In baby teeth, we do like to see some spacing. So we do like to see spaces. So some mommies come in and they're like, oh, there's space between the teeth. It's a <laughs> because okay. we have yes. growing to do and space for the adult teeth to come through. So I hope that partially answers your question. Um, I would love to see her and help you further. Um, but they're, they're kind of some of the questions you can start thinking about and the tongue clicks. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I love that you can do exercises rather than, you know, just having stuff done at the dentist. Okay. Yeah. Is there a way of improving a retrognatic mandible? Yeah, retrognatic. First of all, maybe explain what that is. Yeah. So this is basically just when the mandible, so look at, look at this little boy on the picture, is where the bottom jaw is slightly back, retro. So it's like, you know, retro, yeah, a little bit back, like going back a bit, retrognatic mandible. All right. Yeah. Something like this. So where you would see probably like the, the maxilla, the top jaw. So the top jaw is called the maxilla. The bottom jaw is called the mandible. It looks like the top is like sticking yeah. out. So you would, that that's the, and sometimes kids, kids are like this. People are like this the other way around. Yes. Okay. 
So what can we do about it? Uh, depends on the age of the person. Um, again, it's all the same stuff. The tongue position, um, breathing through the mouth, not breathing through the mouth, exercises. So practicing bringing the jaw forward, um, lip seals. So ultimately, we all want to be for optimum health, lips together, tongue on the palate. And when I say tongue on the palate, the whole tongue on the palate. So when you say the letter N, N and the tongue rolls up to the top of the palate, that's where the tongue should be all of the time, right up on the top of the palate, um, breathing through the nose. So lips together, tongue on the palate, breathing through the nose. Depending on the age, uh, there are things that can be done and it would be subject to a full clinical assessment, seeing what teeth are there. Um, there are things like myofunctional therapy. So myofunctional therapy is um, basically training. Um, yes. This is about the Maya Munchie. Yes, Maya Munchie is good, Amelia. Um, you can use a Maya Munchie. We have a Maya Munchie and you can start working with that. I'll explain that in a moment. So my functional therapy uh, about the muscles. So start training the muscles to be in the correct position, correct swallow, lips together. So remember swallowing with these muscles, not with these muscles. There are a load of exercises that you can do. And depending on how um, retrogonathic the mandible is, you might be, if it's very, very severe and it's an adult surgery, even surgery is an option. Okay, so there's a big, a big, uh, a wide spectrum of what can be done. I'd start with some exercises, uh, looking at the diet, the lip seal, um, my functional therapy, orthodontic treatment or surgery. So that's basically the, the whole picture. Again, subject to a clinical examination. Following up on that question, because Eliana has, has written some more, if a baby is born with that mandible, can it improve on its own? So actually babies do have mandibles that, li that are like that when they're born. So when you look at a baby, they are, a lot of them are like- Like a resist, oh, yeah. Oh, they're born like that. Um, when they breastfeed, so when they're latching, they bring the mandible forward. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the development. And yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. It can improve on its own. So would you think that a, a, a baby that is exclusively bottle fed, that development doesn't necessarily fully work? in the same way as a breastfed baby yeah yes okay <laughs> yeah i mean if you, if you just look at the mechanism and again it's you know it's um everyone has to do what's right for them but the mechanism of what's happening when you look at the physiology and the biology suckling versus sucking yeah is different it's very okay. different yeah okay um another question we have is i know there are oral wipes that you can use post breastfeeding what is your professional opinion on them and at what point should we introduce a toothbrush uh, and so a question linked to that as well yeah sure so sabrina i would say you introduce a toothbrush when the first tooth comes through um because we want to instill good oral habits into our children so we want to get them into a pattern or a rhythm. And it could be they've just got like one incisor, whatever they've got coming through first. And you're just going to give it a little brush um, or get them to hold the toothbrush and just maybe chew on it. You yeah. want to choose something, that's, uh, choose something that's quite soft for them. So you can get like little silicone brushes to start with, like little finger brushes and mm -hmm. get in there to get them used to having that in, in the mouth because yeah. oral hygiene is important for life. And we know in the early years with any habit, if we set them up now, they've got that for life. Um, oral wipes that you can use post breastfeeding. Um, you can use them. I think it's different for everybody. I'm wondering what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to um, just basically clean off the, the sugars from the breastfeeding, you can, if you wish. Um, it's not something that I... I um, that you would recommend necessarily? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's not something that I would say you need to do this, but you yeah. can there's there's no harm in doing that Chem i would worry about the chemicals and wipes and stuff like that but you know because that's absorbed as well um related to this is breastfeeding to sleep we've always we always hear oh you know you mustn't do that um at all cost can't feed your baby to sleep because then they're staying the milk is staying inside and that could rot their teeth what's your point uh, your um opinion on that so our babies need us they grew in us, you. And, um, they're attached to us. And you know, when babies breastfeed, they also activate the parasympathetic nervous system because the tongue is going onto the palate, which is very beneficial. It really relaxes them. 
they are designed to need us. If you look in nature, um, look at animals, you know, they're, they're not separate, they're together. They're being fed, they do absorb all of this. So um, there is a link between, um, you know, sugars in the mouth and dental decay. I think you need to really just look at that uh, relationship for yourself and feel into what's right for you in those moments because you also don't get those moments back and they're very precious and for bonding and attachment um I would say that if you're concerned um you know if if it's like you're in a situation where you're latching like most of the night and they're feeding most of the night and then they've got pooling so they're like they've got like pooling into the mouth this is something that we can look into and maybe you want to um you know think about how often you're breastfeeding but um for me, I feel that the bonding and attachment is very important. And we also understand that there are lots of factors that contribute to dental decay. It's not just one thing. Mm-hmm. If your child is developing dental decay, then we do need to have a look at this and what, what the um, what the processes are at home and, and what's going on at home with the feeding. But if, you know, it's, it's looking okay and you're monitoring those teeth and everything's fine, I would um, think there are lots of benefits to feeding. Amazing. Thank you. I love hearing that. (laughs) One question. um, What does a good palate look like? So we, yeah, I can just pop back. So this would be easier to show you. So these are children, not young, young children, but we want a nice broad palate, broad palate. So at the top here, um, Eliana, we've got this image here. And then at the bottom, we've got this image here. So we want to be aiming for something more like this rather than like this. It's tough to get this. It's it's hard, you know, and most most children do need some kind of intervention. And again, uh, there's a study called Pottinger's Cats. Um, and it's talking about like cats and what they're eating. Are they eating the correct diet and what happens to them through the generations? <clears throat> so it starts off with like they're eating their raw foods, whatever. And then they're fine. And then they start eating more cooked foods. Cats are not designed to eat cooked foods um, in this study. And then they start developing crooked teeth. And then a few generations later, you're getting, unfortunately, stillbirths. Um, And whilst that's a, a kind of like, whoa, really? It's like through the generations, like bit by bit, our diets have really, really changed. Our, you know, our, the way that we eat ancestrally, the quality of the food, how much we chew our food, it's really uh, changed a lot. And it will take time to get back to this broad palate naturally. It's possible, um, but we really need to be mindful of our food choices. Okay, that's good. And then Amelia has a question on the oral microbiome. You're still talking about that later or? Yeah, we can talk about that later um sucking the thumb does affect the shape of the palate absolutely you're pressing something on there even your your straw bottles your hard straw bottle they're they're pressing on your child's palate i prefer cups or sippy cups okay or a microbiome um so at my clinic i don't test this at present um mainly because i don't have the equipment and yeah optimization of the oral microbiome so it starts uh before birth it starts with mom's oral microbiome um and lots of factors in pregnancy when they come through the type of birth that that they've had so was it a vaginal birth um was it a c-section birth was there any seeding so transmission of um some of the microbiome the vaginal microbiome to the mouth at birth um which i learned from red miller about how we optimize the microbiome um through c-section and then there are things like overall probiotics if you want to go down that route or foods so fermented foods um you know natto sauerkraut um uh yogurts uh if you have dairy or kind of coconut yogurt like fermented foods kefir um all of these things can help to optimize the oral microbiome yeah, I actually teach for moms to eat that in pregnancy and include a lot of that in their diet. But then also it's one of the first things that we teach to introduce when you start introducing solids, yeah. sauerkraut juice and all of that. Really, really important. And I just add on the microbiome. Yeah. Part, so for children, um, they come through with whatever's in their mouth, their microbiome, however they've passed through the veil. 
um, they're exposed, their skin microbiome, their oral microbiome to us. So if their primary caregiver has dental disease or an imbalance in their microbiome, we're sharing cups or we're sharing cutlery, um, kissing, all of this, there is a transfer of that bacteria to your child. So if you are somebody who has periodontal disease or undiagnosed disease in the mouth, it can be passed on to your child in just like that. And then they can be more prone to dental decay um, and gum disease. So it's another factor to add in when you're looking at why has my child got dental decay. Um, so always handy for parents or caregivers, primary caregivers to have those dental checkups as well. Mm -hmm. Great. I see one more question and then we'll move on. Oh, microbiome friendly foods. Uh, maybe we can put them down on the, but it's anything that is fermented. So that will give you the good commensal bacteria. So it would be sauerkraut, kefir. I can make a list in the under the video later if that's helpful, Magdalene. Okay. Uh, moving on because we only have 10 minutes. So <laughs> sorry, time flies. Do you know what I think we can do? Let's just talk about er eruption dates and then maybe first dental visit. Um, yeah, that would be lovely. Yeah. Okay. So um, this... This little chart shows you a schedule of baby teeth eruption. Sometimes it is outside this window and that's okay. Um, in the sense that there are, there can be reasons that teeth don't come through. Sometimes they're not even there. That could be one aspect as well. But what would we do if you were to see a dentist um, at kind of age 10 months and a tooth hadn't come through? You wouldn't really do too much. What you can do is massage the areas um, to encourage and stimulate uh, the teeth to come through. Um, also lip ties um, can obstruct teeth from coming through. The first mm. tooth that usually comes through is the lower central incisor, which is just here at the bottom. Yeah. Um, so here, you'd be expecting one of these to come through soon at uh, first, um, around six to 10 months, around that age, can be before, can be after. And then next you'd be expecting the central incisors. Mm -hmm. And Dorinda, I had a question the other day uh, from a mom who said, you know, my baby is four months. I feel that they're teething already, but there's nothing coming out. How how soon does that process start? And are mom, uh, babies to experience symptoms way before they actually erupt? Um, honestly, it can vary. And yeah. this is from my personal experience and from seeing little ones at the clinic. Um, there's no like it's going to be three days. It's going yeah. to, my daughter is 10 months and she, I feel, has been teething for about four months. And yeah. three days ago, she got her first tooth down at the bottom and she's 10 months. Yeah. Uh, my son, on the other hand, he had pretty much his two top teeth and bottom teeth. His two bottom teeth came through first at like seven months. Mm -hmm. so, and, and the experiences were very different as well. So but the process is longer it's not just you know teething for one night and then the tooth is is visible right it takes <laughs> yeah I, okay. wish, I wish it was like that I'm right there with you yeah. um she was like that but it's not um soothing things like I um express milk and make popsicles for my daughter so yeah. popsicles are good chamomile if you're open to that you can dab some chamomile on there uh lots of cuddles latching this for me worked well um depends on the spectrum where you are um if you feel you need something more there is also like homeopathy um you can kind of think about if your little one is really struggling with that but yeah there's sometimes you're just like oh surely it's come through now and I could for her I could really feel them coming and I'm like they're still through <laughs> as a dentist as well um, yeah. sometimes it's just patience and just yeah you just encourage them you can give a little massage um, but I think that's that's all you can do and patience amazing okay so that's all I really want to say on tooth eruption. If there are any questions on that, I'm more than happy to answer them. And then with adult teeth, the um, the back teeth come through first. So the, the tooth number six at the bottom uh, and top, they tend to come through first. So six erupts at six. So that's when you can start to expect your adult teeth to come through. So if you just look at this column here, when the teeth are expected to fall out, and sometimes it takes longer, sometimes it's less. If you feel that um, it's been a long time, like over six months, um, 
like oh like you know we were on seven and a half months nearly eight and the tooth hasn't come out sometimes it's worth seeing your dentist to have a little check maybe it's like in this position here maybe it's not there um the only way a dentist can thoroughly check is by taking an x-ray Mm-hmm. which takes us into the realm of radiation, which I won't talk too much about now. Um, but when you're deciding whether to take an x-ray or not, you just need to think of the risk benefit of the radiation versus the information that you're going to get. And are you going to do anything with this information at this point in time, or can it wait uh, for something else? For example, um, if your child has a raging toothache and a big uh, infection underneath, that's probably an indication to take an x-ray if they would allow for it and they're of a reasonable age and and you're okay with that. Um, If it's just like a standard, let's just check the teeth to see what's there and what's not there. um, Then you need to think, am I going for like myobrase? Am I straightening? Am I doing anything like this? What is the reason? What information are we going to gain um, from doing this? Okay. Okay. Um, There were a couple, I know we've only got five minutes left. Um, I'll just gloss over this. Um, I've got a lot to say on this topic. I have an article actually on my website. Oh, uh, please share it that. with us. I would love to put it under the, and even share it with the group. Yeah, I can share that with the group. Um, it basically, pregnancy and postpartum, in pregnancy, there are hormone changes, estrogen, progesterone, bleeding gums, large gum swellings, wearing of the teeth, Um for all you moms that are going through morning sickness now, um, I know that is a struggle um, and getting any kind of food into your system is a good thing. Um, if you keep being sick, if you can just rinse out with water or like yeah. a sodium bicarbonate to neutralize that acid that keeps mm-hmm. coming up in your system. Um, there are salivary or microbiome changes. Teeth can become a bit shaky. It usually resolves after pregnancy unless there's an underlying issue uh, that has been undiagnosed, such as periodontal disease. Um, We can get candida inside the mouth and a higher risk of dental caries. If we think about this, um, a a lot of what we're taking into our system is going to our babies. You know, our body will take what it needs, but our babies are really, really getting everything that they need uh, through pregnancy and postpartum. Um, with postpartum, it's worth mentioning sleep because which which mommy postpartum gets sleep, right? Um, and it affects our immune system. Uh, so we can be more prone to dental decay. Mm-hmm. Uh, watch if you're a mouth breather. If you feel comfortable to do so, you can do some mouth taping to get your mouth closed because all of this plus mouth breathing is uh, going to be like, oh, are you going to be more at risk at cavities? I have moms coming in saying, yeah, my my baby's taking all my nutrients <laughs> and I've got cavities, uh, which I do see. I do see this. Um, there are lots of factors. So just to go over that and I will share the article. Um, oh, lovely. So Thank you. Want you. To go a little bit more. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I've just stopped sharing my screen for a moment. So first dental visit. Um, I think there are some really lovely ways that we can prepare our children for when yeah. they're going to the dentist. Um, and again, depending on how old your child is, when should they see the dentist? So generally dentists do say when the first tooth comes through, see your dentist, get them used to the chair. For me, I would say, um, use your own discretion. You know your child the best. You mm-hmm. know if they're going to be able to come into a de- the dentist and sit on the chair and have yeah. someone else look at them. Um, you can visually inspect the teeth themselves. Um, there are also ways of communicating with a dentist by taking photos of your child's teeth. I do have children that have come in, um, mom or dad have brought them in wanting a full dental check. We can't see anything because they're just not comfortable, which is fine as well. You can take photos and send them. Like I can see a lot from a photo, not everything, but we can see a lot from that. Um, Tongue tie is a reason you would want to see a dentist. So you want to find a dentist that can uh, diagnose tongue tie well. So that is one, definitely one in the early days that you would want to have checked. Um, So what I really like to prepare children is reading stories. If you have storybooks, Depends also where you are with your screen time, uh, if your child's older, younger, but communicating with them of what to expect at a dental visit and how mm-hmm. it can 
fun um, and what's going to happen. So you might also want to seek out a pediatric dentist or someone um, that has been recommended and that you know maybe they have some toys there or they have something or like they can blow yeah. them up and you know uh, talk to the children. There are stickers at the front desk. Um, you know, depending on lots of factors, um, what's a good fit for you. Something that we can address personally is our own dental anxiety. So we know that our children feed off our energy. Um, you know, when I'm not feeling so great, uh, I always know what's going on there. Like this is, and we also need to um, honor ourselves and understand that we're all on a journey, right? In a healing journey, whatever that looks like for us. Um, so addressing our own dental anxiety. So it actually might be like, if I've had a bad experience at the dentist as a child, maybe my partner takes my child to mm -hmm. the dentist. Um, if if that is um, is suitable for my setup um, or maybe I just kind of sit with myself or I can maybe use something like the emotional freedom technique um, some breathing techniques whatever just to try and move through a bit of my dental trauma before I enter the dental space with my child and then we both sit on the dental chair together potentially and then my heart is racing because I'm like I'm at the dentist and I have my child with me who is feeding off my energy um so that is also one um, aspect. I would also say, um, you know, the way that we communicate to our children about our teeth, you know, it's a it's an important body part. What is it used for? So we use it for eating. So we want to keep our teeth healthy for eating because if we can't eat, we can't grow well, we can't show up in the world well, like however you word it, yeah. um, we, we need them to eat. So we need to keep them healthy um maybe sharing with them what a, a, a healthy smile looks like as well and that we like to smile we like to express ourselves we want these to be looking healthy um getting uh brushing twice a day getting into this habit um more so the habit of it than you know it being an absolute necessity to brush every tooth for two minutes at eight yeah. you know let's get real you know let's have some real conversations about this because Brushing a child's tooth for two minutes in the morning and before bed is, I mean, if you can do that, please reach out to me. <laughs> I would love to know what you're doing, right? <laughs> but getting them into the habit of brushing and using positive uh, reinforcement and, and vocabulary around teeth. You yeah. know, when we're making our food choices, it's like, oh, you know, sugar's going to rot your teeth. Well, actually, yes, that is partially true. But also the mouth breathing is going to dry your mouth out and you're going to, you know. Yeah. There are many really different factors, yeah. yeah. There are lots of different factors. So I think it's everything in balance um, and, and having healthy, those, making those healthy food choices in your home space um, yeah. to encourage them to be set up live with like healthy or, or um, habits um, and healthy teeth. Amazing. Great. Well, I think that concludes our session this morning. I was really, I'm really grateful for you joining us today. Can't believe it's taken us so long to connect, but I'm really happy that you were here today. And then maybe, you know, more detailed, -ish, uh, a more detailed talk on pre pregnancy and so on could maybe be beneficial too not just because i've never looked at that as aspect of how our dental health and what we do in pregnancy can actually affect our children in that area as well so anyway thank you thank you and thank you for all the mummies who joined i know some of you have had to leave already but um thank you as always to uh, for joining us this morning Absolutely. I would just like to say thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, and if you want to reach out to me, I am on social media. Just pop me a message. If you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to help. Amazing. Thanks. I'll share all your details in, under the video as well. Thank, thank you so much and have a lovely day today. Day. Bye. Bye.